Now we know what floating point notation is and how we can convert back and forth between deanery and binary, let's look at a few more important concepts including how we can normalise our floating point numbers. So first of all, let's look at what range and precision are, two important terms related to this topic. First of all, precision, also called accuracy, is how accurately a number can be represented. And in floating point, precision is really determined by the size of our mantissa. If we've got a small mantissa, we can't represent a really, really small number or a really, really big number. And so we want to ideally have a bigger mantissa to increase our precision. But we do have a trade-off versus range. So range is referring to how many values are we able to represent in our floating point notation. And this is determined by the size of our exponent. So when I say size of mantissa or exponent, I mean how long they are, how many bits we've got allocated. The more bits we've got, the bigger precision and the bigger range we can have. The issue is, you know, in an ideal world, you can just have massive mantises, massive exponents. But in reality, we've only got finite space in memory. So we've got to limit it at some point. We've got to have a trade off between our precision and our range. Do we have a bigger mantissa and a more precise number, but therefore a smaller range? Or do we make a bigger exponent, have a big range, but our numbers are not as precise? So it is a constant trade off because for each fractional number, we only have so much space we can allocate in memory. And this process of normalization is helping us with this, helping us maximize our precision in particular. And this does work generally. So moving our radix point, or in this case, moving our decimal point, here we've got standard form. Now in green, this is how you should show it. In standard form, we've got 3.2 times 10 to the power of seven. This is 32 million in standard form. But we've also got other versions which are not normalized. So here, 0.032 times 10 to the power of nine is the same as, same thing as saying 32 million, but it's not in standard form. Neither is 32,000 times 10 to the four. It's also 32 million, but not in standard form either because they're not normalized. I am wasting space in my mantissa because I've not put my decimal point in the correct place. These zeros at the start and end here are not needed. I could have got rid of them and just increased my exponent. So we're wasting our precision here or possible precision here by not storing things very efficiently. Another issue, another reason why we need to do normalization to our numbers is we only want one way to be able to represent a number. Now, I'm sure you realize by now that in computer science, we hate ambiguity. We hate where we've got more than one way to represent something. We need to have one definitive way, otherwise it causes confusion, it causes a misinterpretation. We should not have a situation where the answer I have for a floating point number is different to the answer you have for a floating point number because that just causes issues down the line. Normalization ensures we've only got one definitive answer and so it removes that ambiguity. So let's talk normalization for binary then. We don't care about decimal from now on. Let's look at binary only. So in normalized floating point notation, the digit before our binary point is our sign bit, assuming we're doing things in two's complement, of course. And when it's normalized, the digit after our binary point needs to be significant. So I'm sure you've heard of significant digits, which in binary means it's either a one if it's a positive number or a zero is significant if it's a negative number. So here, for instance, we've got an example of an unnormalized binary number because looking at our first two digits in our mantissa, the first one is fine, it's a one, it means we've got a negative number. The second digit, the one after our binary point, is not ideal because it's not significant. Because two's complement is really flipped, a one is insignificant, whereas a zero is significant. And so a quick way of checking to see if it is normalized or not is if the first two digits match, either in positive or negative, it means our number is not normalized and so we've got to fix it. Whereas here, another example, this number is normalized because our first two digits are different, so this is perfectly fine. This one on the right is maximizing precision, the one on the left is a bit wasteful. So just to give you the general rule, we need to fix this by floating our binary point until we reach the 1.0 pattern or the 0 0.1 pattern, and then we adjust the exponent to reflect this floating, this shift. To give another example of the effect of not normalizing a number, here at the bottom we've got this number which is not normalized. The first two digits are the same, therefore it's not maximizing precision. Let's say we're limited to five bits for our mantissa. And representing like this is wasteful because let's say our actual number is meant to be 0.001011. Those last two ones are effectively not used if we are limited to only five bits in our mantissa. And so having an unnormalized version is really wasteful because I'm having to lop off those two ones when actually I could have used them if I just shifted across 
and fixed it to become normalized. So we often lose precision because of space restrictions, which is not really our fault, it's just a fact of life, we've only got so much memory space. But what we can control is how efficiently we are storing our values and normalization is making things efficient. Right, so let's look at how we can actually go about normalizing a couple of examples here of unnormalized floating point numbers. The first one here is equivalent to the denial number six. Remember, you can still have non-decimal numbers in floating point. But here we can see it's not normalized because my first two digits are the same, two zeros. So I need to do the following to normalize it. First of all, I must leave my sign bit intact. I can't make a mistake, you know, I can't change that zero to a one. I've got to be really careful to keep it intact. But I'm looking to perform a shift until I end up with the first two digits being different. So I want it to be normalized. So really I'm looking for where is the first case moving right to left, moving left to right, sorry. I've got a zero followed by a one. So really the first instance is here. So I want to try and move my binary point just one space. I'm really shifting my number. I'm doing a left shift of one here to move my binary point just one place. And for every shift I do to the left, I need to subtract one from my exponent. And the reason why I'm subtracting one here is because my number is getting bigger. When I do a left shift, the number is now bigger. So this number here at the bottom is now bigger than the number at the top. And so therefore I need to modify my exponents so that they are the same. And I subtract one each time every movement I do. If my binary point was moving to the left and I was doing a right shift, I'd have to add one to my exponent every time it moves. But here it's subtracting one each time. So I've just got one shift, I'm subtracting one. And so once I figure out what the exponent is minus one, I have my final answer. And notice here that what I've had to do is add in the zero myself. By me shifting it left, I kind of didn't have anything here. But because we need to make sure our mantis is kept the same length, I needed to add in a zero, pad a zero, just to do this. It doesn't do anything to this number, but I've still got to add it to make sure it fits. So the final line there is our answer for the normalized version of six. So it's now stored more efficiently. Let's have another go at this for part B. I'll do this one myself. We've got this horrible looking negative number here, minus negative number. Thankfully, we don't have to actually work this out ourselves. We can just normalize it without worrying too much about what it is in decimal. So here it's not normalized, right? I've got two ones back to back. So I'm looking for, like before, I'm looking for where is the first case where I have the 1.0 pattern, which is over here, right? So I'm looking to put my binary point between the one and the zero here, because none of these would allow me to have a normalized number. So how many shifts have I done here? I've done one, two, three. So I'm doing a left shift of three. The reason why it's a left shift and I'm moving right is that it's the number itself which is moving left, not my binary point. I said binary point is moving right, but it's a left shift here. So if I write up this number again, I can ignore these ones now because they add nothing to my number, they're not significant. I can do 1.0100 is now my mantissa. And the point being, my number has got bigger when I've moved it across like this. And that's why I need to subtract three from my exponent to make sure it's balanced. So initially, 1101 was what in uh, decimal, this is minus three, it's two's complement, remember? And I want it to become minus six because I want to do minus three, minus three. So minus six is going to be 1010 zero, zero is minus six. So my exponent is now going to be 1010. Zero, zero. So it's this times by two to the power of 1010. Zero, one, zero. Um, so the only issue here before I'm finished is just to add in my zeros I lost. So I've lost. Uh, you know, I needed one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight digits of my mantis, and now I've got five. I need to add in three more, and I just add in these zeros at the end. Now they are significant here. Before they weren't significant because this one at the top was positive. This is negative, so they are significant, but I still need to fill up all the space, otherwise I'll get the wrong answer, and it won't make sense in memory.